Hey, thanks, Todd. Uh, this is really fun for both Edith and I because, Edith, it's probably been over 10 years. Well, when, when did you go to Jacksonville? How long ago was uh, that? 17 years ago. 17 years ago. Oh, my gosh. Well, when did say, well, you know, I was in the East Bay. Well, the fun thing here is both Edith and I were on faculty at UC Davis. Right. I was part of the East Bay program down in Oakland. You were up in Sacramento. And as I have watched your career grow and I keep thinking, you know, one of these days, I wonder if Edith would even remember me. She's so famous now. In Come the world on. Of <laughs> anyway, it's, it's really great to see you. As Todd was uh, starting to, and just to share with you and our physicians who are watching out there, breastcanceranswers.com is a social media site. The idea was to converse to people in layperson's language. Mm -hmm. uh, we started this um, a little over a year ago. We now have over 600 videos on the site that include people like me as a surgeon, a medical oncologist locally, radiation oncologists, survivors, and others. And as Todd just said, as of last Friday, we've had over 6.3 million views of our videos. Wow. And so in a sense, this is sort of an extension trying to have the opportunity to interview people like yourself uh, here at this meeting. So uh, really welcome. You are a real expert when it comes to 9831 and, and some of the other things going on in the world of HER2 new. Uh, we've got a physician audience out there. What can you share with uh, all of us about 9831 and HER2 new? Oh, what a great question. You know, the, the story of HER2, you know, it's a story that started back in the, in the mid 1990s right. with the identification of the HER2 gene and the HER2 protein and then the availability of trastuzumab, you know, in metastatic disease than in the adjuvant setting. So N9831 was one of the trials in the adjuvant setting that, as you remember, you know, eventually led to the approval of trastuzumab uh, right. Right. because it uh, resulted in significant improvements in disease-free and overall survival. So, well, Wouldn't you say it's one of the sort of breakthrough things that's happened in our world of cancer, yeah. or breast cancer, the last couple of decades? We can say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was really a pleasure to, you know, to help develop this clinical trial and conduct the trial with the help of many people throughout the U.S. But in the context of doing the clinical trial, we also thought about some translational studies okay. that would be good to do in the future. Okay. So we collected tumor specimens, we collected serum, yep. we collected peripheral DNA yep. that we are now using to interrogate the material so that we can better understand why some people do extremely well and why some other people don't. Perfect. In other words, not all HER2 news are the same. That is right, yes. All right. And yes. anything that you can share with our colleagues out there that are percolating out of your drilling down sort of assessment right now? Yes, you know, we've done a variety of <laughs> studies. We've looked at membrane markers, we've looked at cytoplasmic markers, and nuclear markers. Okay. So, you know, I think uh, for the general practice or day to day practice, it's really important to understand that either evaluation of HER2 protein or the HER2 gene appear to be appropriate okay. uh, for decision making for trastuzumab. <clears throat> the second important issue that we've looked at is the criteria for HER2 positivity, because there are actually two sets of criteria. There you go. The ones that we used for the clinical trial, which are the FDA approved criteria, okay. then the 2007 ASCO CAP criteria, which are a little bit different. And they, this has led to some confusion. Right. So we published a paper uh, a few months ago in the JNCI clarifying the point that for decision making, physicians should use the FDA guidelines. Very good. Okay. You know, and okay. By that, what I mean is for immunohistochemistry, right. if more than 10% of the cells are positive, that's okay. three plus. Yep. If they perform fish analysis for gene, yep. if uh, they ha the tumors have two or more copies okay. of HER2 gene over the centromere, then that is considered positive. Okay. So very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. But in addition to that, in the area of HER2, we've looked at HER2 protein using other strategies, such as aqua, which is a quantitative immunohistochemistry technology. But we're moving beyond this. All right. You know, well, tell us more. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're, you're wetting our whistle here, Edith. Tell us more, please. Yes, we, because we think it's also going to be important to look at novel technology to evaluate her too. 
including RT-PCR technology. Okay. So we have an ongoing collaboration uh, with Genomics Health right. to look at the technology that is utilized in the Oncotype DX test yes. to determine if we, could, we can correlate HER2 by RNA expression right. and benefit to trastuzumab. Okay, very and good. And we expect uh, this data will be ready for ASCO 2013. All right, very good. Now hold that thought for a second. Todd just looked at me, and I think he wants to make an announcement in case people want to send. They can actually get us some questions live. So oh, hold on is. a second. Okay. If you would like to submit in a question to Dr. Harness or, or uh, Edith Perez, by all means, go to breastcanceranswers.com, and in the top right corner is a box that you can fill out your uh, question, and it'll end up right here in my computer, and if appropriate, they, are you guys okay if I interrupt you and ask an appropriate question? If you're polite. <laughs> if I'm polite. All right, let's see what I can do. So if your question's polite and I'm polite, maybe I can get it into this great conversation. Dr. Harness, I'll throw it back over to you. All right, Todd, thanks very much. Yeah. So please go on with your story. is fascinating, yeah, absolutely yeah. important and fascinating. Yeah, because there's even more than that. Uh, yeah, so, please, you know, we're, we're uh, all I mean, ears it, here, it's, okay. It's very exciting <clears throat> because in addition to this work that we have started to do looking at RT-PCR technology yes. for HER2, actually at this San Antonio breast meeting, we have some breakthrough uh, data uh, is that embargoed to, right now, or can you talk it, about it? It's embargoed, but I can tell you in general in what general, this is okay. about. Yeah, because uh, okay. essentially, with again collaborative effort, we be able to do uh, genomic profiling in more than a thousand specimens from N9831. Uh, with uh, this being the first time that we report a relationship between gene expression profiles and benefit to adjuvant trastuzumab wow. uh, in the context of N9831. Whoa. That's very important stuff. That's oh right. my goodness, That's right. congratulations. Thank you. I Thank don't you. want to ruin the embargo. I don't want to be in trouble. And that's all for now. This is going to be posted tonight. Yes. So anyway, please go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it, what we have done you know, with ideas as well as assembly of a, of a great team and in really a vision is that we've gone from taking you know, one marker. Yeah. We've tried to figure out how to best evaluate the marker agents uh, have become available that target that particular uh, biomarker. So we've been able to do the clinical trials, do the translational work to wow. optimize patient care now, globally. Let me ask you a question. Obviously, besides trastuzumab, yes. th there's other members of that family, if yes. you will, yes. specific toward HER2. Yes. Um, are you going to be able, with your most recent analysis, be able, be able to start looking at the other family members and see if some are effective with certain profiles and others are not as effective. What a great question. You're still smart, Tanya. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Thank laughs> great, yeah. You. Yeah, we are very interested in uh, actually three other members of the anti her family, yes. uh, certainly lapatinib, yep. uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. We are also interested in pertuzumab as well as TDM1. Wow. Uh, so our follow-up projects, you know, will incorporate uh, these other anti-HER2 agents to see how our predictive model really applies to those other agents. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Speaking of TDM1, why don't you share your thoughts with our physician colleagues about TDM1? Because we all know yes. stage 4 patients now, and I know it's not approved yet for generalized use, but there Correct. may be humanitarian uses of it. Correct. But uh, please share with you, you know, the, the stage four patients who are progressing now, uh, what are your thoughts about TDM1? Fascinating drug, you know, and it uh, really builds on the idea of drug antibody conjugates. So TDM1 is a combination of two compounds right. uh, joined by a linker. And the two compounds are trastuzumab, so an anti her monoclonal antibody, connected with an antitubulin agent called DM1, uh, which is a derivative of metansin. Yes. So by combining these two compounds into one, the idea here is to deliver chemotherapy directly to the cells that are HER2 positive, then direct the chemotherapy delivery to those malignant tumor cells. Right, right, right. By right. doing that, we can optimize efficacy while minimizing toxicity. Yeah, exactly. You know? 
So we and and so how do you envision TDM one sort of becoming yeah. available for use and yeah. things like that, Edith? What are your thoughts on that? I tell you, we've had experience with this agent over the last several years because that because at Mayo we have participated in the clinical trials of TDM one in the refractory HER2 positive okay. setting, All right. but also in trials evaluating TDM one in the first line setting. Wow. So we expect uh, that there will be approval by the FDA and the other regulatory agencies in the refractory setting based on the results of the AMELIA trial. Okay. And this is the trial that, as you remember, was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine right. recently. Right, right. Demonstrating improved efficacy of TDM1 over the current standard capsatabine okay. with lapatinib. I know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then we're moving even beyond this well, because tell us more. Come on. Uh, yeah, actually we have a All manuscript right. impress okay. uh, based on a randomized phase two study we conducted of TDM1, a single agent versus docetaxel trastuzumab for patients eligible to receive first line treatment for her positive disease. Right. And the data are really very provocative, supporting a larger phase three trial that is called Marianne. And Marianne. How do you guys come up with these names? <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> Amelia and Marianne. All right. Is there a trial name, Jane? No, just kidding. We, we should talk about that. There we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so Marianne is it's a global trial that I'm actually part of the steering committee of right. that has com already completed a crawl of more than a thousand patients. Whoa. Uh, first line metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer with three uh, arms. Number one, taxane trastuzuma. Okay. Second arm is TDM1 alone. Okay. The third arm is TDM1 in combination with pertuzumab. Do you see a future for TDM1 alone? It sounds like you're thinking there may be a future for that because as you know right now, I want to talk a little bit about neoadjuvant yes, yes. Uh, trials and uh, with uh, uh, and HER2 new positives. And right now we don't have any with a single agent. It's combined with, you know, uh, other chemotherapeutic agents, et cetera. So what are your thoughts? Will TDM1, do you think, be a single agent at some point? Right. Possibly? Well, you know, based on our randomized phase two study, really it fared better than the combination of uh, docetaxel, trastuzumab, although right. it was based on a randomized phase two, and that's why I think it's so important to evaluate the data of the phase three Marianne trial. Right. But, you know, Marianne, we're actually looking at TDM1 in combination with pertuzumab. Okay. Uh, because that also may be a very good strategy for dual HER2 blockade with a little bit of the chemotherapy that is part of TDM1. Okay. Uh, because we're looking at two aspects, safety and to also to maximize efficacy. Right. So I think TDM1 is a very good drug, but I hope it's even going to be optimal to, to do to, dual targeting. Elaborate a little bit on the concept yes. of tagging on to a monoclonal antibody with a chemotherapeutic agent yeah. and, you know, and being able to, uh, you know, use it uh, that way because I think that combination is just, uh, the, the, well, let me put it this way, the thought process of being able to do that is really exciting to me. And by, and by the way, I have to share with our physician colleagues out there that uh, several years ago, one of my medical oncology friends said to me, you know, Jay, someday surgery will be adjunctive therapy. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I hope so. <laughs> Well, Maybe after I retire, but I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, we need to continue looking at uh, optimizing the efficacy of our agents. Okay. Uh, and maybe someday that will be the case in which surgery okay. may not be required for most patients. That is not the case uh, in 2012. It. I know But that. I think we're building towards that possibility. Yeah. Now, yeah. if it, in the last couple of minutes that, that we've got, Yes. Let's assume that some folks just tuned in here over the the last three or four or five minutes or so. What's the best way to sort of summarize your excitement about this meeting? Because like always, you're at, you're the ever ready bunny. You're always <laughs> excited and enthusiastic. But in summary, the things we've been talking about. What do you think in your area is is sort of the take home message from San Antonio for you? You know, it's the realization of our idea that by working collaboratively with investigators and patients from throughout the world, answers are becoming available to help patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, very good. And your excitement about the future of trastuzumab and that family 
what are what are your thoughts on that in summary? So I, I think it's really very provocative to think what we've been able to do with uh, HER2 and anti-HER2 therapies over the years, where right. we've essentially converted HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer or HER2 positive early stage breast cancer from a subtype that essentially led to mortality in a high number of patients to one that is very mal manageable yeah, for many, many really patients. True. I mean, a great positive story. Right. And then using the technology that's been developed by Genomic Health, what are, what are your thoughts about looking, because we've been focused so much with the Oncotype DX when it comes to ER positives. Yes. What are your thoughts about looking at and helping you understand the differences in HER2 using that technology? What are your thoughts on now, This technology of interrogating uh, the RNA through RT-PCR in the context of gene expression will provide us the necessary answers so that we can optimize, you know, a prognosis, a predictive ability, as well as the potentially develop new strategies for therapy. Well, I really like it. I, re I really like the idea of the predictive uh, value uh, of all of this. Well, I want to tell you and to my col our colleagues out there over the internet, what a joy, my darling, to see you again after all these years, you know, and just thank you for all the fabulous work that you're doing. You're just sort of an endless source of inspiration and energy. Maybe I can get a little of that to wear off of me, too. All right. All right. It's great to see you. Thanks so very much. Scott, back to you.